Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. Today we want to get into modeling, but just as some announcements, we will, or your passport is due this Friday. I think that's due at 11.59, so hopefully the game will be over and you can go home and complete your passport if, if that's how late you put it off. I don't believe the drop box will close, so if you miss the deadline, the due date, it's probably okay. You can still submit your passport if you're having trouble getting it uploaded, and that's one of the reasons for this assignment, to see if you can interact with the D2L technology or your setup to interact and submit your homework problems, which is how we will do or allow you to do that. You will also be able to just hand them in in class if you're a local student. That homework assignment is due in a little over two weeks, and I still haven't decided how I'm going to perform or administer the prerequisite quiz. So I better do it soon or it will no longer be a prerequisite. You already have learned everything. So we'll see how far I get, but today we will talk about modeling a mechanical, a linear mechanical system. Maybe it's called a rectilinear. Just think of a straight line and we won't worry about gravity. We will then develop a state space representation. A state space representation is not unique. That's why it's not developed the state space representation. It's a state space representation. And then we will see if we get into sketching an all integrator block diagram which allows us to visually see this, let's say, mechanical system in terms of a block diagram and we can also see an electrical circuit in a similar block diagram, meaning all of our systems we can now model as this block diagram image and we can start developing the same ideas or understanding no matter what domain we're playing in, whether it's electrical, mechanical, electromechanical, you name it. They all can be sort of envisioned in these different forms. Let's start by simply outlining a way to approach this. via a modeling approach, and this may just start to be very fluid for you after you've done it a, two, a few times, but for now, just to give you a way to mechanically process through this, let's just line it out in some steps. First, what you want to do is define the system and the boundaries in which that system is defined. What are you including? What are you discarding? What are you focusing on in your particular system? Then you want to actually identify the variables that you will be needing to describe the dynamical behavior of this system. That's what we're interested in. We're interested in the dynamics of these systems and we need a way to capture that and we'll have to define or identify certain variables. And if you're familiar with the electrical concepts, maybe you have talked about through variables and across variables, where something going through a variable might be the current and something across an element might be the voltage in electrical terms. You could do an analogy. There's many different analogies between electrical and mechanical. One of those is to say, let's make force analogous to current. And if that's the case, then velocity is analogous to voltage. And that analogy allows the sort of the block diagrams to look consistent between the electrical and the mechanical. We won't necessarily go into all of these analogies. We're just going to probably play with them straight up. Oh, we're in a mechanical system or a mechanical environment. Let's write the equations for that. 
then once we've identified those variables, we want to write the equilibrium and or the compatibility equations. So in electrical terms, you might think of KCL and KVL. In a mechanical system, you might think of, oh, the sum of the forces is equal to zero, and maybe we have certain linkages or compatibility conditions that have to be satisfied. If you have two positions or two links, you know those links maybe aren't changing in your particular mechanical setup. The fourth step in this process is to then write the physical relations that exist between the variables. And what are those for the electrical environment? We talked about that Eli and ice, Eli the ice man, those are our physical relations between variables. Certain forces in the mechanical systems, your spring force position relationship, or a dash pot, your force velocity relationships, those are like Eli and ice in terms of those are our physical relations in the mechanical setup or mechanical environment. Once we have those, then we simply combine all of those, or you could say, go ahead and substitute the expressions or the variables found in step two and these physical relations from step four into your equations that are governing the dynamic behavior of your system. That's the process, this modeling approach that tries to give us a strategy for working through writing equations of motion. Does everyone enjoy this classroom environment as much as I do as far as these empty seats? Those are hard to claim if you come in after everything else is full. So what we may want to do, I know we're engineers and we like consistency and so we're going to sit pretty much in the same seat every time. Maybe we want to squeeze in before we begin and then people that are having to come in a little bit later, don't have to struggle. I have to struggle during exams. If you, if you know you like to ask questions on an exam, maybe you should sit on the outside of the rows so I don't have to try to snake my way around. I might fall over. I've been known to walk on the table, so don't make me do that. Go ahead and if you know you're going to have a lot of questions, you might sit on the ends. And that goes for the online students. You might sit on, no. <coughs> we'll figure out what you're doing. This mass spring damper system is something that you are actually going to just have up here in the next week or two. This is what we're playing with in the lab. And you need to basically become very, very comfortable with this system. There's our mass, M, looks like a mass. Then we are going to have a spring, which is going to be one end connected to the mass and the other end connected to an, in, an unmoving boundary or a wall. Then we are going to have a dash pot. So if you're thinking of shock absorbers, we're pulling that shock absorber into two pieces. We're pulling one piece out as a spring and the other one is the damper. So we're 
explicitly separating those two aspects that you might think are connected in a shock absorber of a vehicle. And we give this spring a constant of K and the dash pot will label with a damping coefficient of B. And then we will apply a force to this system. And actually, I may change that because that force is going to be our input. And I may just replace that with U. And that's not a step input. U is now just a general force. So hopefully by context, you will know what we're dealing with if you say, oh, there's an input U of T. That doesn't mean that's the step input necessarily. It usually will not be the step input in a controls class. Is that clear? U of T is just a generic input that we are using to drive or command that particular system. Now, by way of getting you to think about this, can you write down the equations of motion that govern this system? Go ahead. Do it. How does that work? What do you have in this mass spring damper system? Can you derive the equations of motion for that system? And does your modeling approach that we just talked about, does that help you do that? And you can talk to your neighbor if you want. I'll interrupt you in about a minute. So it should take you a minute to do this, is what I'm saying. How many people have lectured before or stood up in front of a group and had to speak? Have you felt this time warp or this time difference? Boy, a minute's a long time when you're standing in front waiting, waiting, waiting. And it's probably very, very short, especially if you're taking an exam, right? Oh, there's one minute left. <gasps> I'm still on the first problem. There's five more to go. Oh, well, partial credit. All right. <clears throat> Where do we start? Well, the first thing we want to do is figure out what we need to keep track of. And to help us with that, let's just, I mean, in this case, it seems almost artificial, but let's just make sure that we have the system and the boundaries. I mean, it's staring at us maybe too much in this case because there's nothing else really floating around. There aren't any more masses or animals or anything else on our page. It's pretty clear what our system is, but we could say, here is now our system. in terms of the system boundary. That's what we're interested in, just this M, K, B, and U, or force, applied force, this external force. What are our, so if we're now doing, that was step one, that was quick. Step two, what are our variables of interest? What are we interested in? We want to K 
capture the dynamic behavior or model the dynamic behavior of this system. We want to be able to do that. What do we need to keep track of if that's what we're interested in? Pardon? So we are going to apply that force U on the mass, and what's that going to do to our mass? It's going to move it, isn't it? Shouldn't do that. The wheels are locked. But we... So this has a lot of inertia, doesn't it? If the wheels are locked. But if I had a mass here, and I'm not going to worry about gravity, I'm worried about that mass's position, aren't I? As I push it, or as I apply the force. So I need to somehow keep track of the position of that mass, and it really doesn't matter whether I draw that position there, if I draw a line in the sand and say there's my zero position, or if I center it on the mass, as long as you've now located where you're calling zero, and now you'll work from that point on. And now I'm interested in not only the position, but also the velocity. So I am actually interested in x and x prime. The displacement and the velocity. And if I can actually find the dynamics of the position and the velocity, if I can model those, if I can describe those, then I can actually tell you what that mass is going to do as a function of time relative to that force, that applied force. Now I want to, the beauty of this tablet is I can just scroll back and forth, can't I? You maybe don't want to look at the screen if I'm scrolling back and forth too much. And especially if I haven't yet reached a steady state. Maybe that's a sinusoidal steady state, but not... Sorry, that's probably making somebody's monitor blow up if they're online. So now we want to write the equilibrium and or the compatibility equation. Which we can do for this mechanical system by means of a free body diagram. Did anyone start drawing a free body diagram? I turned away when I was looking for hands. Did I see any hands? A few brave individuals will admit that they did maybe a free body diagram. Let's try that. So now step three is we're trying to get some equations. And a good way to do that in a mechanical system is to draw this free body diagram. And to do that, I am simply going to sketch, and if this was more elaborate or more complex, I might have a free body diagram for each of the masses or the points that can move independent of the other points or masses. Here I just have one mass. That's M. And now I want to capture all of the different forces that are acting on that mass. And the way that I like to think of that is if I have this mass and I've now identified this zeroth position, let me now translate that or move that mass in a positive x direction and ask myself what forces basically respond or are introduced by that displacement. I now go back to this picture and I go, if I displace this mass slightly to the right, and I apologize to those that are online, they didn't just see that image, but now virtually take that mass and move it to the right. And what is opposing that or maybe aiding 
that movement to the right? What forces help or hinder that movement? Everybody hear that? That's what it sounded like to me, but I don't have very good hearing anymore. Everybody else heard it? There's a force due to the spring, correct? If I push that to the right, that spring is going to oppose that movement. It's going to be pushing back to the left. If I move this to the right, that dash pot is also trying to oppose that, and it's a velocity opposition, but it's still opposing that movement. And one thing that, and we have the force that's helping us. So let's write those down. We have the spring force. Let me call that F sub K. We have the force of the dash pot opposing that movement. And we have the applied force that's actually aiding, or it's in the direction of that movement. So it's actually going in the direction that we want to, or that we've labeled as X. Yes? So now the question is, should the dash pot force be pointing to the right instead of the left? And that's what we have to get our minds around. If I now move this to the right, which way is this dash pot going to, how is this dash pot going to oppose that movement to the right? It's now, you're wanting to go right, and it's saying, no, no, don't go right. It's pulling to the left, correct? So you could sort of think of this similarly to a spring. It's now just removing energy from your system, whereas a spring just gets energy and then gives it back. Gets it and gives it back. This dash pot is removing, so now you could think of this as somebody tugging when you're going this way. And that now allows us, did I draw that in the correct direction? So that's now opposing movement in the positive x direction. Is that clear? Yes. What is a dash pot? A dash pot, you'll see it in the lab, but a dash, <laughs> that's a good answer, isn't it? So the dash pot is the piece of your shock absorber that is removing energy from your system. If you had a pure spring in your, on your car and somebody excited your fender, it would never stop in an ideal world, right? The dash pot is extracting, so you could think of that as the frictional force that's actually removing energy from the system. So with the dash pot, when you do this, when you push on that, so that, I'm sorry, on the shock absorber, you have both a spring and a dash pot. And we're extracting, we're looking at those uniquely or individually. We have the spring piece and the dash pot piece. So in the lab, we have a dash pot that's basically a clear tube that has some, some kind of material that's rubbing up against the tube that removes energy, and we have a spring. So the dash pot is something that's extracting mechanical energy out of your system, and it's a function of the velocity of the movement of that mass. That's the dash pot, and it has a coefficient of B, just like the spring has a coefficient of K, and the spring, its force is proportional to the position or the displacement. The dash pot is going to, its force is going to be proportional to the velocity of the mass. Does that help? Are we finished with our free body diagram? I like to just, I, I find this easier for me or more, what do I say? want to say? Easier to sort of keep track of everything if I in, introduce one more force. You've learned F is equal to MA. 
F is equal to MA. F is equal to MA. That's physics. Oh, F is equal to MA. Well, here we're actually going to say that MA is an inertial force. So we're going to treat that just like another force in our system so that we can just say the sum of the forces, including the inertial force, is equal to zero. And our inertial force is just like this table. When I start to move this table or this mass, it has a lot of inertia, right? And which way is that inertia? What, what direction is that inertial force in? If I now said I want to move this mass to the right, which direction is that inertial force directed? It's to the left, isn't it? So I'm going to now say that this also has an inertial force, and I'll call that F sub I, in that particular system. That's the MA that will be accounted for when we say F is equal to MA. Now we say, oh, we have an inertial force in addition to all of these other forces, and we'll just sum the forces to equal zero. And we won't have to say the sum of the forces equals MA. MA we've accounted for with that inertial force. That's just the way that I like to do it. So if this is now our free body diagram, How do we write our equilibrium equation? Now it's just the sum of the forces are equal to zero. Or the algebraic sum of these forces are equal. In this case, we simply take all the forces to the right and set those equal to all the forces to the left. That's our equilibrium in this particular case. We will reach equilibrium or we will be at equilibrium if those forces algebraically are equal. Meaning, what do we have going to the left? Well, we have our inertial force. We have our force due to the dash pot. We have our force due to the spring. And those are all equal to the applied force. Questions on that? That makes it pretty easy, doesn't it? In terms of writing the equations. Now we've written the equations that govern that mechanical system's behavior. We want to now identify the counterparts to Eli and Ice, basically, for this mechanical system. What are our physical relations? between these different quantities. I just said that the inertial force, F sub I, is M A, or M X double prime. That's our inertial force. The force due to the dash pot is proportional to the velocity of that mass. And the proportionality constant is that coefficient b. So our velocity or our dash pot force is b x prime. The damping force. Then we have our spring force. Hooke's law is that do I have the right person? associated with the spring hook. That's just Kx. That's proportional to the displacement of that spring. And that spring, in our particular case, is going to be displaced by the same amount as the mass is moving to the right. So that this is now our spring force.
five was to put all of these pieces together. We have the inertial force, mx double prime, plus the damping force, vx prime, plus the spring force, vx, is equal to u. In your one-minute exercise, did anyone come up with that for their dynamics or the way that this system is behaving? If you didn't, that's okay, but I hope you were a little bit more motivated to try to figure out what in the world he's, is he going to do to find these equations of motion. What you want to be able to do is now reproduce that on your own. So you need to go home tonight, and before you go to bed, start drawing this, maybe not on your pillow. You can put it on a napkin or a piece of paper and put it under your pillow after you've drawn it, and you'll just have this memorized by the time you wake up. Because this is what you're going to be playing with all semester in the lab, is this mass spring damper system. You want this to be your friend. Now, another approach to this that, in terms of modeling, if you weren't comfortable with that inertial force, if you said, well, I, I really grew up with F equal MA, that's okay. We should be able to reproduce, but I find it a little bit more challenging when our masses, when we get many more masses and springs and dash plots floating around, I like to just play with inertial forces on each of those masses. But the classical approach simply says we have the sum of the forces, these external forces, is equal to mass times acceleration. And if that's the case, then we have our applied force U minus the dash pot. That's removing, or that's acting opposite to the movement. The spring is also acting opposite to the movement, and that's equal to M X double prime. But now if we know what FB and FK are, and if we put them over to the other side, we end up with U is equal to M X double prime plus F sub B is just B X prime, F sub K is K X, and we have our same equation that we had before. M X double prime plus B X plus K X is equal to U. Sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. I will prefer to do it this way by sketching this free body diagram, identifying the direction that that inertial force is going, and then just sum all my forces and set those equal to zero for each interconnected piece of my free body diagram. Now that we have, if you didn't get this far, did you sort of have a feel for what order of a system we had with a single mass? Did you know we were maybe going to have a second order system? Or were you not there yet? So now we have a second order system. Let's find the transfer function for that system. And if we're interested in the transfer function, what do you remember from earlier classes that we don't have to worry about if we're interested, if we have these differential equations and we want a transfer function, what do we not have to worry about to derive the transfer function? Do you remember? Can we neglect something? We can neglect the integrated circuit. Oh, sorry. The initial conditions. We don't have to worry about initial conditions, do we? If we're interested in the transfer function, we can neglect the initial conditions. We are just looking for the relationship between the input and, in this case, the output, which could be our position. So if we now Laplace transform this 
that x double prime is the second derivative of x with respect to t. x prime is the first derivative of x with respect to t. If I now transform that, or Laplace transform that time domain second order differential equation, what happens when I Laplace transform little u of t? That's the hard one because it's so easy. Capital U of S, you just have to hit the shift key. Shift U, now it's capital U of S. You've now taken it into the frequency domain. You've Laplace transformed little u of t. We don't necessarily know what u of t is, but if you give it to us, we can, we can Laplace transform it and generate capital U of S. Now, what happens when we Laplace transform M x double prime. M is a constant. We're assuming that mass is not changing, so it, that's constant, capital M. Our Laplace operation can go straight through that, or we can factor out the capital M, and we just have to worry about Laplace transforming an acceleration, or x double prime. And I think I heard somebody say it. That's S squared, isn't it? So this now becomes, how do I want, let me pull the S squared out, S squared M capital X of S. And now that you've seen that, you should be able to immediately write down what the Laplace transform of BX prime is. And what's the Laplace transform of k, x of t? Little x of t. That's the other hard one, I guess. You now have k, just capital X of s. Are we okay with that? Now we can factor out the common term on the right, which is the Laplace transform of the position, x of t, so we have S squared M plus SB plus, and you notice I, the order, this is SB, not BS. I don't want to give you any ideas at this early point in the semester. So you don't have to worry about just learning some BS in this class this morning. So it's SB plus K times x of s. And that's u of s. And we want the transfer function between the input u and the output x. So that now g of s is simply this ratio of x of s over u of s. We can solve for that by dividing both sides through by what's in the parentheses and dividing by capital U of S, and we end up with 1 over S squared M plus S B plus K. And that's now the transfer function of that system in the lab. Now in the lab we might have some hardware gains and so there may not there may be something that we have to introduce relative to the relationship between the applied let's say voltage and the force that that produces so we may not have just a one upstairs or in the numerator questions on that now we have the differential equations and we have the transfer function of that mass spring damper system. Why don't we measure or model that by a state space representation? A state space representation, and how big is this A state space representation going to be dimensionally? Our system matrix. How many states are we going to have? 
and does this transfer function help us in any way? Or we could say, well, you know what? Usually we have state variables as x's, and I used x as my position, so can I sort of go back here and change and say, why don't we maybe for now, let me change x and x prime to z and z prime. Is that okay? So my position is z and my velocity is z prime. Meaning now, let's say that my differential equation, second order differential equation is, oh, and now I've, well, here, let me sketch this again. Let's say that we now have This is what we have in the lab. Here's B, here's K, and let's go ahead and introduce a scaling factor in front of the U. So U gets scaled. U might be our voltage that we're applying to this motor to introduce a force on this mass. We now have gamma U as our force that's applied to that system. If we now say, oh, he's wanting to change, so let's just say our position is z and our velocity is z prime. If that's the case, so z is our position, z prime is our velocity, can you now write down the second order differential equation that governs the dynamic behavior of this mass spring damper system. And I'm hoping you can say yes. Right, this is exactly what we had before except now we have gamma u instead of just u. Meaning we have gamma u driving m s squared plus, whoops, I said time domain differential equation, didn't I? So now I have M, Z double prime, that's MA, plus B, Z prime, maybe I should put all of these in time, plus K, Z of T, and this is U of T. I get a little bit careless maybe with my arguments of my variables, but I usually try to stay with lowercase and uppercase in the time domain and frequency domain. This is now our governing set of equations. And we want to find a state space representation for that. How many state variables do we anticipate having for our for a state space representation? How many state variables do we anticipate having? What's the order of this system? How many derivatives do we have? Two, don't we? This is a second order system. So we would expect to have two state variables and that will collect or that will allow us to model all of the dynamic behavior that's occurring. We should then be then expecting a second order or at two state variables. Our second order differential equation says that we have two state variables. And these state variables capture or contain all the information we need to describe the dynamics of what's going on in the system. These state variables possess a state or condition of the dynamical system.
which if we simply know the present and future inputs, and if we combine that, that's sort of a very general addition symbol, with the present time state or the state at the present time, that's going to allow us to determine our future state variable. Meaning if the input u of t, and that could be more than a scalar, it could be a vector, we could be applying many different forces, we are saying that we need to know that for all time t greater than the, nor the present time, which I'm labeling as t sub 0. The present time state vector is simply x at time t sub 0. This is also potentially a vector. It could be a one by one vector, it could just be a scalar, and t sub zero is our present time. If we know what the state of the system is right now at the present time, and somebody tells us what input we're applying now and all times into the future, you can then, with this state space representation, calculate or you know what the state is going to be doing for all future values of time. You are going to be able to determine x of t for all values of t greater than or equal to t naught. That's this concept of state. And what we want to be able to do is derive or put this second order differential equation into a state space representation. Because if we can do that, then if we understand how to apply or utilize this state space representation, now if somebody gives you a new system, you go, oh, give me the state space representation. I can play with that as much as I want. Oh, you have another system, a different system? Oh, give me the state space. And now you say, I know how to play with a system when it's in a state space representation. All of these different systems, mechanical, electrical, electromechanical, they all can be modeled in this manner. What's the deal? The state, we're still okay. We still have a few minutes. I think that clock is okay. So we want to go from this second order differential equation into a state space representation. And the very first step that we do is we solve for that highest power derivative. So we solve for z double prime. That's our very first step in this process. The differential equation I might simplify to d period e period. But now what I'm saying is we now take and solve for the acceleration or z double prime. That's now equal to minus d over m z prime of t minus k over m z of t plus gamma over m u of t haven't done anything other than isolate one variable, and that one variable is the highest power derivative in that second order differential equation. 
we will pick up at that point, but we will try to find two first-order differential equations from that second-order differential equation.